Okay, well we're here at 82 um, Roslyn Gardens. This is where I came to interview Rowie in 1977. Rosalind Norton? Rosalind Norton, two years before she died. And we went, we went down the stairs here. You can see that these steps are visible through the glass at the bottom yeah, of the stairs. Look. And Rowie had two sisters, um, one of whom was very close to her, called Cecily. Cecily was older. And she lived down there first on the left. Yeah. And then you go down a very shadowy um, corridor, and Rowie lived right at the end of it on the right-hand side. And that's why I did the interview with her. It was very dark. It was dusty. Um, there were bones, um, lizards, cats, dogs, skulls, the whole, the whole business. So how there. old was she then? Well, she died. She was 62 when she died, so she would have been 60. Okay, so it was two years before she died. Two years before she died. 1977. 1977. And I wanted to get a handle on particularly what her magical um, experiences were, what was driving her art. Um, I was researching it for a book I did called Inner Visions that was published in London, which was the first writing I did on her. And she told me particularly about, say, figures like Lucifer, that some people assume was a devil, and she, um, she, she always had a different angle on these pagan deities that were so different from what the general populace understood. For example, um, Lucifer, which means light bearer, was not for her a demonic figure, but just um, uh, an, an antagonist that could pull you back into a normal perspective if you're getting too big for your boots. And she was one of the gods in uh, he he was one of the gods in her pantheon, okay. along, along with Hecate and the great god Pan. Yep. She spent most of her career trying to justify her belief in pagan gods and goddesses. So that that's what it was about. But she she believed in them as a living presence. They weren't just figures from a book on mythology. They were real for her. Okay. Well, here's your book. Yeah. That's the Witch of King's Cross. Witch of King's Cross. Yeah, it's a reprint from Pan's Daughter, which was done in 1988. This was done in 2002 with a few corrections. Yeah, let me just get it there. That's nice. Now, so tell us a bit more about Rowie, like, as the individual. Like, well, like, she was very, she was quite She short. got you to try and... Yeah, take she, some LSD, didn't she? she? She got me to try and take some LSD with her. I've taken LSD in the past. This is like a 60-year-old woman. <laughs> I mean, she, she got interested in drugs at the end of her life. I don't think drugs informed her art all the way through. Okay, okay she that's interesting. Yeah, she got interested in self-hypnosis to begin with. Yeah. So she could go into all, all the states of consciousness without taking drugs. But so trance-type stuff. Yeah, trance stuff. But definitely in the, se uh, in the 70s, uh, she died in 79. So right through that decade, she was interested in... Um, in LSD and, and psychedelics, but that was that was when her art got very lurid and very highly coloured and textured. Okay. And in a way, a bit gaudy, I, I think. All right. So early on, it was more measured and more refined, but still based on trance. Stages. So did she play up to that whole Witch of King's Cross mythology? She that did. Grew when, up around her. Yeah. When she first started, she was a trance artist, but later on, when the media said, "Oh, you're obviously a witch," she didn't even come out in funny conical hats. Like, like she was playing a part from The Wizard of Oz, for example, because she looked vaguely like Julie Garland with a few teeth missing. And, and she'd <laughs> prance around for the media, and they made the persona, and then she built on it. Right. She, she didn't even like witches to begin with, according to Wally Glover. Mm. And Wally Glover was the publisher who published her limited edition book in 1952. Okay. So how long do you reckon she lived at uh, Merton? Here? Here, I'm not sure. I really don't know. It was the last phase of her life. But there was a little garden area that opened out into the daylight in there too, okay. so she quite liked it. So she had, she had lots of pets at, yeah. at the end of her life, like mainly cats. And yeah, she loved cats always. And spiders and lizards. Yes, and all, all of that. Very Cut, sort of witchy type stuff. Yeah, coming in and out of the house. and She loved being in, the, in, in a bath, sipping Strega liqueur, which has a little witch logo, and listening to classical music. She particularly liked Sibelius and Mozart and Beethoven. Okay. Um, so that's how she spent her day. And she was still completely active as, an, as a painter, as well, an artist? A little bit, but I think she was just selling works in the street to get a bit of money. She was very poor by that stage. Right. And she was a recluse. She wasn't really doing many media interviews at that time. Okay, so as a younger man, like, uh, like what, what drew you to try and sort, seek her out? Well, I'm very interested in the relationship between magic and visionary art. Yeah. And I've been interested in that for 40 years. Okay. And when I... In 1970, when I was in, 19, in 1970, I was living in the country and I saw some um, pictures by an English occult painter called Austin Spare and I, I researched him in the, in the British Museum. And one of the things I've done in my occult writing over the years is to compare Austin Spare and Rowie Norton because they both had many similar techniques. They both used trance techniques. They were both interested in magical sigils and symbols. They, 
They can be found in the artworks of both artists. And they use altered states of consciousness to heighten their creativity. Right. So that, that's, and my dad was an art teacher at East Sydney Tech, so I've always been interested in those two things. And so I studied Austin Spear in England, and then later on, um, one of the books I wrote in 1980 with Gregory Tillett was called Other Temples, Other Gods, which was a right. history of the occult in Australia. And I got an angry phone call from this guy um, called Wally Glover because I'd used a few Rowie Norton pictures in that book without asking anyone's permission. And I didn't know he was the copyright holder. Okay. And he was the person who published her book of uh, visionary artwork in 1952. Okay. It was banned when it was published. And he got the copyright back in, early, uh, in the early 80s. And his motivation for being angry with me was that I had stolen a bit of the thunder and got some stuff out about Rowie before his reissue of The Art of Rosalie Norton, which was the book he'd financed in 1952. Okay. So um, when he rang me up, I said, well, look, I'm very sorry about, about um, accidentally infringing the copyright. I didn't know you had a relationship with it. He explained to me that one of the deals was he had rescued Rowie Norton and um, Gavin Greenlees on their charge of vagrancy. Um, in, in the early 50s, right? because that was a common problem for people. Bohemian uh, people like her could easily be arrested by the police for not having enough money to have a, a livelihood. That was a, a crime in those days. Yeah. And she was very much targeted by the cops around King's Cross. She was, yeah. Bumper Farrell and other people like that. And so Wally Glover one day went down to Central Court just deciding to help some vagrants and maybe employ them in a journalistic capacity. and. It just happened to be Rowie Norton and Gavin Greenlees, who was her um, lover, her yeah. young lover, poet. He was much younger than her, yeah? 13 years younger. Okay. And so he gave them employment, and he thought at first he'd just hire them to write advertising copy for his trade magazines. That, that's what he wanted to do. Right. He took them to his, to his office, and they, they, they showed um, him the artwork, some of this amazing symbolic artwork that Rowie had done, and also some of Gavin's surreal poems. And... Uh, over, over the period of months, it gradually dawned on, on Wally that maybe he could put out a collector's edition of her drawings and issue it as a limited edition book, and that's what happened with The Art of Rosalie Norton. Right. He published it and financed it, but it was a devastating blow to him when it became an obscene and, and blasphemous product on publication. Yeah, so he couldn't sell it. He couldn't sell it, and uh, eventually there was a court case, and the, the finding of the court case was that the book could be sold, provided two of the most offensive images were blocked out. Right. So some of the collector's editions from that period have those two pages mm -hmm. removed. There was an image called um, Black, Black Sabbath, which had a, um, a, a young woman fornicating with a black panther, who yeah. was supposed to be a symbol of the night. And there was a sort of a demonic figure called Faux Hat, who had a serpentine penis. Those are the two images that caused offence. So people that have the collector's edition with those two pages blocked out um, have a very early version of that book. So basically what happened was um, Wally lost the copyright for a period of years and when he rang me up in 1980 or so, um, he was on the verge of wanting to reissue the book as yep. a facsimile. He got, the, he got some money from an insurance case to finance it. And I said, well, look, you know, I work in book publishing. There's no reason why we have to be enemies. I can be an ally. And I finished up writing an introduction to that book and helping him reprint it. Okay. So, the book was reissued without the block plates. All the all the pages were intact, and it, it went through without a hitch. So there was no problem anymore. Okay. Now, did you ever go to the Apollonian Cafe? I or? did very briefly before it was demolished. Okay. What was it like? Well, first of all, tell us exactly where it was. Well, I didn't go inside it. I just went to the outside. It was just on the corner of um, William Street and Darlinghurst Road. Okay. And, and it was my understanding. Just across was, from the fire station. Right. And it was demolished to make way for the the, the, the overpass. Uh, okay. No worries. Mm.